The, the issue is not Israel, and I think Americans should wake up to reality. Reality is that Iran develops capability in order to advance their mega historical goal, domination of the Gulf and the Sunni Muslim world. In order to attain that goal, they have to remove what they perceive to be the mega obstacle, which has nothing to do with Israel. It's the U.S. military power projection. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue in the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Zola Levin presents with Miles and Catherine Weiss. Shalom and welcome to our program. I'm Miles Weiss. And I'm Catherine Weiss. And we hope you're enjoying our new set. You know, it's the year of the open door in Hebrew, 5774. And so here we are, a new set, new open door for us to bring you the same message with the same meaning because God is on the move. You know, Yeshua said in Matthew 25 that He would gather the nations to judge them. And we're seeing that set up in the world today, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we need to view current events through the lens of the Scripture. And like you always said, Miles, the headlines are catching up with the Bible. Exactly. We have the final word in Scripture, so we know it's a good story. It has a happy ending. We're in good shape, but there may be some bumps along the way. And in this program today, we're going to hear from two fantastic speakers, Bill Koenig of Watch.org, and Yoram Ettinger, who is an Israeli spokesman, a think tank uh, consultant, and one of the greatest voices today regarding politics and the way they're shaping up to really line up with the Scripture. So, without any further ado, let's go to Todd Baker, our staff theologian, as he interviews these two men. Well, it's a very interesting perspective because, you know, Obama said over and over again, especially since March of last year, that he has Israel's back. And at the same time, he's been putting people in positions such as Chuck Hagel, John Brennan, the CIA, uh, Samantha Powers is his UN ambassador, and also Susan Rice is the National Security Council head, uh, that are not extremely pro-Israel. So that obviously concerned a lot of us. At the same time, Obama's reassuring the, the people, and especially the Jewish uh, people that helped put him in office. They ran a brilliant campaign, and that's really how he got elected, uh, not only in 2008, but 2012 as well. Uh, so, from our biblical lens, um, we're concerned about the fact that the recent deal uh, in Geneva with uh, the P5, which is the five members of the UN Security Council, Russia, China, uh, France, Britain, and the United States, and Germany, the plus one, is, is a bad deal. It's a bad deal for Israel. It's a bad deal for the Middle East, but a good deal for Iran. So we started looking at the scriptures more carefully, and uh, obviously that's the lens which we watch the Middle East. And we looked at Jeremiah 49, 35 through 39, okay. which is a very interesting area of prophecy that's not talked about very often, but it talks about Elam, which is Persian, which would be Iran. And this particular area speaks of Elam being devastated uh, in a conflict where they will be broken, which uh, the bow, uh, their military, the missile launching, that they will deal and experience a devastating blow. And as you see the week that they were meeting in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, Khamenei and uh, Rouhani and other leaders of, of, of Iran were speaking horrible things about Israel. They were calling him a rabid dog. They were mm. saying, we're going to eliminate this Zionist entity. I mean, this is at the same Crazy. time the international community is negotiating in Geneva. That should be immediately be a reason to step, step That's away. That's a big red flag right there. I, exactly. So, as Bible prophecy is, what is written will happen. And that's why we're looking at, as the Lord is allowing this leadership in Iran to become more boisterous and vocal and more militant, uh, militant, yeah. that He is going to allow this to happen and they're going to experience, in my belief, a devastating defeat. Their people will be spread f far and wide and that the gospel will be spread out uh, throughout Iran like never before. Amen. Amen. 
Well, you know, and I'm sure you've heard of the historical analogy. Obama suing for peace with Iran is like uh, Nevelle Chamberlain. You know, in 1938 at Munich, you know, we have peace in our time, and he waved the white paper. I, I kind of see the same thing being done today with this, you know, recent new deal with Iran. What are your thoughts on Absolutely that? Absolutely agree with you. Uh, we're hearing a lot of people talk about that. People in Israel, uh, within the administration, uh, and also Charles Crothammer. A lot of us appreciate his work here at uh, here in the states with Fox. Uh, he said the same thing. A lot of people are comparing the the Chamberlain Hitler agreement with. Uh, the U.S. P-5 groups uh, deal with Iran. A lot of parallels. I mean, do you not see this as a dangerous entity? Do you not realize that 56 percent of the world's oil is right there in the Persian Gulf and inside of Iraq and inside of Saudi Arabia? Do you not know that this is a conflict between Shia Islam and Sunni Islam? Do you know for the fact that Saudi Arabia is petrified of a nuclear Iran, they believe that they will be second after after Israel. Uh, do you not read? The, I mean, this intel that I mean, do you not believe the intel that you're reading about this uh, dangerous presence that's being set in the Persian Gulf? And if Iran controls that oil through the Persian Gulf, it will bring the world economies to their knees. It's it's, it's flabbergasting, really, to, to be honest with you. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, this, this agreement also uh, still allows uh, Iran to continue with nuclear enrichment? Yes, enrichment, uh, I believe it's up to uh, 5%, it might be up to 20%, but basically everything they've pretty much have already been working on, they have another six month period mm -hmm. uh, of, of pretty much work that they need to be, in their estimation, needs to complete the weaponry uh, of the development of their nuclear bomb. I don't have all the specifics, but I do read this. Uh, to summarize it, yes, those things that were most crucial in terms of stopping this will not really be addressed fully until about six months out, and very likely Iran will already be finished. You know, it reminds me of when uh, President Clinton was negotiating with North Korea and he believed, hey, they're going to stop their, their endeavor to try to get nuclear weaponry. And they made a deal. And of course, we know that North Korea reneged on it. Well, that's a perfect parallel. Senator Cruz brought that out this week. He did a great job of, of explaining uh, the Clinton hopes with the 94 agreement with Korea and uh, North Korea and the fact it hasn't worked at all. And the other sad irony to this is the fact that North Korea is working very closely with Iran. That's true. On how to disguise your program. And also they believe that a lot of the uh, potential missile launching capabilities will be perfected uh, in that North Korean-Iranian relationship uh, be, without anything being done on uh, Iran's shore in terms of a longer, more sophisticated missile. I do know for a fact that, there, that Iran has made significant uh, inroads uh, over the last 24 to 36 months in, uh, as far as their short term, or sh uh, I should put it this way, short range missile capabilities wow. that puts those Persian Gulf countries at risk. This is a great interest and a great concern to those countries because, and that, that's from one of Israel's top missile experts, Uzi Rubin, who helped develop the uh, aero missile defense system. Uh, he's the one that said they have made incredible leaps in, in technology over the last few years. And that has a lot of people concerned. And then the ICBM is what uh, North Korea and Iran's working on that would put Europe, uh, as well as Russia and the United States at risk of a long-term or long-range future uh, nuclear uh, target. Well, we're certainly uh, right at the threshold of so many end-time events, and all of this that's going on is certainly precipitating that, isn't it? Well, it's right there. You know, the, the time clock uh, is Jerusalem. That's God's time clock. And uh, the nations of the world are still obsessed with the dividing of the, the land of Israel. Uh, let's put it this way, the, the, the nations of the world uh, the leadership of the world wants to make Judea and Samaria an Arab state. 
It is so important to understand Israel in these times that we're living in. You know, if we don't understand the view of Israel according to scripture, it's like taking the hands off the clock and we won't know what time we're in in this prophetic time that we're standing it's in. It's exactly right. You know, Israel is the prophetic time clock. And as things are intensifying in the earth and as the nations are setting up, getting ready to come against Jerusalem, according to scripture, good news as well, Hormoz Shariat, a good friend of ours, is preaching the gospel every evening into Iran. And so there are people getting saved by the hundreds, sometimes by the thousands, because of the gospel going forth into Iran in Farsi, in their own language. And it's a wonderful story that we never hear That's about. That's right. And so you need to know that there are good things happening among the Persian people. We'll be back after this. Hello, I'm Wayne Fournier, and I've been a supporter of Zona Levitt Ministries for many years. If you see this outreach as worthy of your financial support, please call us at 1-800-WONDERS. Visit us online at levitt.com or write to us at Zola, Box 12, 268, Dallas, Texas, 75225. We depend on your financial sustenance. Thank you. When we're there, when we're there in the land of Zion, next year in Jerusalem, the Shana Haba'a, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem, O oh Lord will be with you and no more tears. O oh Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done next year. The Shana Haba'a, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem, the Shana Haba'a, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem. Israel is where the Bible comes alive. We would love to host you on one of our upcoming tours. You can go to levitt.com or you can call 1 800 Wonders and talk to Sandra directly. So come join us and experience the land of God's covenant. That's great. You know, we always love going. We love to take you there and just see the transformation that takes place in your hearts as you join us in Israel. You know, scripture says in Joel 4, 14, Hamonim, Hamonim, Bimek Hecharutz, that multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Wow. And the nations are being set up. They're gonna come against Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. We see that happening. We're going to bring you Yoram Ettinger. Todd interviewed him. He is a voice from Israel. He's an ambassador level voice. He's an insider and he runs a think tank in Israel. So let's go to that interview now. Well, in my assessment, uh, this agreement reflects determination by the White House to learn from history by repeating rather than avoiding uh, mistakes, mistakes which were committed uh, in the negotiation with uh, North Korea. The fact is that for 50 years, the current methodology was used also with North Korea. And the output is very obvious. Another anti-American rogue regime with nuclear power in North uh, Korea. For 50 years, they tried negotiation and diplomacy and economic sanctions and carrots and sticks, and they were testing to no avail. For the last 30 years, the same methodology has been employed with Iran, and here we are at the end of the last lap of the Iranian nuclear marathon, and once again we hear that there is a chance for uh, diplomacy as if we haven't had a 50-year and a 30-year mm -hmm. track record. The other concerning issue is that this agreement could very well catapult uh, Iran from a medium-sized tactical controllable threat to a super-sized uncontrollable uh, strategic threat with apocalyptic uh, vision which does not render itself to mutual assured destruction. The difference between a nuclear Iran and a nuclear Soviet Union is that the Soviet Union were constrained by their own concern for mutual assured destruction. 
the apocalyptic nature of the Iranian regime does not lend itself to be concerned about mutual assured destruction. And we can get a glimpse of what is this regime all about when we go back to their war against Iraq, where they sent 500,000 youngsters to clear minefields mm. in order to facilitate the war against Iraq. There are those who claim that Iran is just like North Korea, no big danger to the global safety. The difference is North Korea does not harbor any imperialistic megalomaniac aspirations to control Asia, to control the world. Iran does. Iran wants to dominate the Gulf. Iran wants to dominate the Sunni Muslim world. Iran's want to dominate Consequently, the rest of the world. This has been their worldview. And therefore, a nuclear Iran would bode more insanity to an already increasingly insane world. Yeah, and Iran has always said uh, before and now after this, this deal, which I think is, is no better than the deal that um, Naval Chamberlain made with Hitler, and we saw where that went, uh, Iran has stated from the outset and continues to state that one of their first objectives is to destroy Israel. Well, the, the issue is not Israel. And I think Americans should wake up to reality. Reality is that Iran develops the capability in order to advance their mega historical goal, domination of the Gulf and the Sunni Muslim world. In order to attain that goal, they have to remove what they perceive to be the mega obstacle, which has nothing to do with Israel. It's the US military power projection in the Gulf, in the Indian Ocean, Middle East at large. And in order to remove that mega obstacle, they developed the mega capability, which is nuclear. It has nothing to do with Israel, not the Arab-Israeli conflict, not the Palestinian issue. The, the problem is that the U.S. negotiates with Iran as if Iran is a rogue regime which considers peaceful coexistence. With such rogue regimes, it pays off to negotiate. But Iran is a different type of rogue regime. While they negotiate with uh, John Kerry and Obama, they support the killing of Americans in Afghanistan. They support subversion in the pro-American Arab oil producing regimes in the Persian Gulf. They collaborate with Venezuela to stir up anti-American feeling sentiments in Latin, uh, in Latin America. They are the number one patron of anti-American Islamic terrorism, including scores of sleeper cells in your own uh, continent. And at the same time, we hear that they are partners to peaceful negotiation. Mm. Peaceful negotiation and the Ayatollah's regime in Tehran are a classic case of oxymoron. Yes. And there's certainly a clear and present danger now. Uh, you had uh, referenced uh, North Korea, and, and, and Obama, I think, is making the same mistake President Clinton made when he thought he could no negotiate with North Korea and get them to uh, cut back and altogether stop their nuclear program. And, of course, they were stringing him along. And well, in fact, the, the leader or the chief negotiator with North Korea is exactly the same oh, person who could today negotiate with Iran, Miss Wendy Sherman. Miss Wendy mm. Sherman was Mr. Clinton's chief negotiator. She failed miserably with North she Korea. Did, yeah. She's given now another chance. And guess what? She's following exactly the same path of once again concessions, once again appeasement, once again diplomacy and testing intentions, which did not work with North Korea, has not worked with Iran, and there is no reason why one should think logically it will work again with uh, Iran. Well, in light of this, of course, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister of Israel, has, has boldly and courageously stood up and, and denounced this. Um, what will Israel do in light of, uh, let's say, Iran continues down the road of, of nuclear acquisition? What do you see the state of Israel doing well, eventually? It seems to me that, again, after 30 years of failed economic sanctions and diplomacy, uh, there is, this is the time to reach a common sense conclusion. And the common sense conclusion is that those who are intimidated by threat of war are bringing war, in fact, that much closer to the free world. And therefore, there's only one working uh, option, and this is 
preemption, a military mm -hmm. preemption, and I emphasize with no boots on the ground. There's no need uh, to employ boots on the ground if one wants to obliterate the nuclear infrastructure in uh, Iran. It would be much easier for the U.S., but it would be also possible for Israel. For the U.S., you have a huge military presence in Bahrain, in Saudi Arabia, in uh, the Persian Gulf, in the Indian Ocean. It would be a medium-sized military exercise with bunker uh, busters, sophisticated missile warheads uh, launched at those missile uh, bases. For Israel, it would be uh, significantly more complex, but uh, this has been the story of Jewish history, a very complex uh, uh, history, very challenging uh, times, and so far we have withstood those challenges with much success or else we wouldn't be here. Our resource this week the DVD series Bad Moon Rising. This two DVD set contains eight half-hour programs hosted by Dr. Jeffrey Seif. The series chronicles the circumstances surrounding the Holocaust and likens them to events happening in our time. Witness the remarkable stand made by German churches against anti-Semitism. Contact us and ask for the DVD series Bad Moon Rising. The Jewish nation uh, was established because everywhere the Jewish people went, they were uh, persecuted, hounded, and threatened. And then with the Shoah, finally, uh, they realized we've got to go back to our home where we belong. Well, not, not only where we belong, but where we uh, serve uh, the interest of the free world in the most effective right. way. It's time for people in the U.S. to realize that there is only one, only one effective ally uh, for the U.S., not only in the Middle East, but anywhere in the world. Namely, Israel is the only ally of the USA with both capabilities as well as willpower. You have many allies with capabilities in Europe, but they have lost God, they have lost faith, mm. they have lost confidence, and they don't have the willpower. Israel is the only one, and at a time when the Arab tsunami is sweeping more and more pro-American elements in the Arab world at a time when the Arab tsunami highlights the unpredictability, the unreliability, the treacherous, the violent, intolerant nature of the Arab Islamic Middle East. This is the time when Israel is more and more highlighted as the only stable and reliable and capable commercially and militarily, the only democratic and most importantly, the only unconditional ally of the U.S. And while the U.S. is in retreat from Iraq and Afghanistan and cuts dramatically the defense budget while the threats to the U.S. are mounting and Russia and China penetrate deeper and deeper into the Middle East and beyond, the only element in the entire world that can bridge the gap between the shortening American strategic hand on one hand and the increasing threats and the needs is Israel. And therefore, the alliance between U.S. and Israel is much more appropriate and natural at this time of the Arab tsunami and the Iranian threat. The tragedy is that this agreement signed with nuclear, with the nuclear Iran, this agreement is in line with American policy vis-a-vis -vis Syria and vis-a-vis -vis Egypt, etc., proves once again that the American administration is intent to focus on the tumbleweeds in the Middle East while it is being smothered by an Egyptian sandstorm, Syrian sandstorm, Iranian sandstorm, Islamist sandstorms, and here they're dealing with the Palestinian tumbleweed, which is along the road here on, uh, or there in the Middle East. Yeah, it's really sad at a time when the U.S. Well, and the Obama administration needs to strengthen their ties with Israel, they seem to be through this uh, deal with Iran, and they seem to be greatly weakening those ties. And it's troubling for us here in America who support Israel for political as well as uh, theological reasons. It's frustrating for us. But well, uh, but one should pay attention that luckily the American political system does not allow 
for a monarch, for does not allow right. for a single dominant branch of government. And today, we experience unprecedented U.S.-Israel strategic cooperation, economic cooperation, not because of the White House, sometimes even in spite of the White mm. House, but primarily because this is the will of the American people. This is the will of their representatives on Capitol Hill, the House and the, and the Senate. And most importantly, this is an outcome of the unprecedented mutual threats facing both the U.S. and Israel, build on top of very healthy, unique foundations of shared Judeo-Christian values. We don't have any other set of relationships as we do have with the U.S., where it is bottom-up type of relations, unlike all others which are up to the bottom. I so appreciate Yoram Ettinger's viewpoint. You know, he speaks politically, yet you can hear the wisdom of the word behind what he's saying. And really, he draws a parallel, the connection between America and Israel and the importance of that shared destiny, doesn't he? Yeah, they're the people of the book, yes. right? And God has intended us as a nation to stand and align himself, align ourselves with his book. Yes. When we do, we're able to see clearly what's happening in these days. You know. Yes. The world always wants to uh, focus on giving the Palestinians a nation and dividing Israel, but there's a real danger in that we see in Scripture in Joel. Yes. But if we pray that the, that the surrounding nations mm. would align themselves with what God wants for them, which is to absorb these Palestinians yes. into their nation, yes. there wouldn't be such a such a war going on, it's Miles. A, it's a big prayer that yeah. we're reaching for, that the surrounding nations would absorb the Arab, their Arab brothers and sisters into their nations. Right. The alliance between Israel and America is appropriate and natural, we heard Ettinger say. It's the only democracy in the Middle East, and they're there to stay. Amos 9.15 said that we would be planted in the land, right. never to be uprooted again. In fact, we have a friend that just we just sent to Israel to help harvest the grapes with the Orthodox Jews in the mountains of Samaria, in the heartland of That's Israel. That's fulfilling scripture. And scripture is being fulfilled. Even the rabbis in the mountains of Samaria have said that this is of God, this prophetic ending is of God. Zechariah 12.9 tells us, et kol hagoim, Habaim al Yerushalayim, the nations will come against Jerusalem. And that's why in these days, more than ever, we need to stand with the people of Israel and with the city of Jerusalem. And so until we see you again, remember, Shalu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter, is free and full of insightful articles and news commentary from a messianic perspective. Visit Levitt.com to find our newsletter, along with current and past programs, our television schedule, and much more. Don't forget to order this week's resource by calling 1-800-WONDERS, or you can purchase it from our catalog at Levitt.com. Your donations to Zola Levitt Ministries help these organizations bless Israel. Please remember, Zola Levitt Ministries depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you.